Hi everyone, I'm Derek Cartwright, and this is another contribution in the series that we're calling Curator's Corner. And today I want to talk about some work that I've done for the Timken a long time ago and how it connects to some recent work that I've been trying to do um, on my own. And so if you'll bear with me, I'm going to share my screen. And I should say that over 20 years ago, I was an assistant professor at the University of San Diego, and I received this really generous invitation from Nancy Peterson, who was the museum's director, the Timken Museum's director at the time. And Nancy said, you could pick any painting you'd like in the collection and give a lecture about it, and we'd love to hear what you have to say. And because I'm trained as an art historian who works on North American things, I gravitated to that gallery and picked the painting that I'm showing you on the right. It's a painting by Benjamin West. Its title is Fidelia and Speranza, and it dates from 1776. And I knew West very well from my graduate studies and from looking at his paintings around the world. Um, I didn't know this painting by the Timken at all, but I wanted to figure out how it fit into his broader career, um, what it might suggest for scholars who were interested in American painting in the 18th century. And I was really excited about the project and I'll always be grateful to Nancy Peterson for that invitation. Uh, I gave the talk and I guess it was well enough received that Nancy and then her son, John Peterson, who became the next director of the Timken, asked me if I would develop a small exhibition around it. And it's the kind of thing that I think the Timken always does well is these small focus shows. And so I brought together <laughs> the paintings that were relevant to our painting and tried to tell a bit of a narrative that would put the painting into a larger context. Uh, in 2004, we mounted that exhibition, and uh, I still think about that work from time to time. So I wanted to step you through a few of the ideas that I've had then and since then uh, when it comes to Benjamin West. Uh, this is what Benjamin West looked like as a young man. For those of you who don't know his biography, it's a kind of improbable story. He was born outside of uh, Philadelphia in rural Pennsylvania and was recognized as a prodigy as a young uh, man, even a teenager, and his patrons, people who thought he had promise, arranged to send him to Europe so he could study firsthand some of the greatest works from antiquity. And so I'm showing you on the left a portrait, a self-portrait of West, and I think he carries himself in that way that suggests all of his confidence and uh, promise as an artist. Uh, he goes to Italy, um, travels throughout Europe broadly, and ends up in England. He never returns to the colonies, never returns to his home in Pennsylvania, uh, and has this meteoric rise as a young artist, and eventually becoming the first historical painter to George III in England, which was as high as you could go in the British art world, almost. Um, when West is in Europe, he's studying, as I said, from uh, Renaissance paintings back to antiquities, and his uh, sketchbooks are filled with drawings like the one I show you on the left of figures in ancient robes. And, uh, and I think it's in that space of being a young artist that he comes to define himself as a painter, and uh, these sketchbooks serve him throughout his career as sources for his ideas. The painting on the right, I think it's interesting because not only does it show West trying to uh, pay homage to his North American roots, but it's also a painting that simultaneously tries to show his knowledge of antiquities. And by that, I, I mean to say that that pose of the Native American man on the right hand side of the picture on the right is drawn heavily on West's exposure to antique sculptures like the Apollo Belvedere, which I'm showing you on the left in this image. So uh, this was a sculpture that was considered in West's time and, and really since then to be the epitome of antique carving, even though it's actually a Roman copy of a lost Greek original bronze, uh, it was seen to be the ideal male nude. And so it shouldn't surprise us really that West takes that model and uses it as the prototype really for the pose of the uh, Native American man in the painting, an American Indian 
family, which I showed you just a moment ago and which is in the center of this slide, but also for his contemporary representations of um, British men and women. So on the right, I'm showing you a mezzotint, which is a, a print copied after a painting by Benjamin West, which shows a British military figure, Robert Monckton, in that very same pose. Um, West's career is sort of on the rise as he gets to England in the mid 1760s uh, and he catches the attention of the King of England who looks at paintings like the one I'm showing you on the right called Agrippina landing at Brundisium with the ashes of Germanicus, a painting which now lives at the Yale University Art Gallery and it's the perfect neoclassical moralizing history painting, an image that shows the dignity of this widow who returns home with her husband's ashes in defiance of the people who ordered his death and uh, everybody in the crowds sort of parts as they uh, recognize um, the heroism and loyalty of this scene. And it's the kind of painting that would have inspired audiences to talk in terms about loyalty to country, loyalty to family, and things like that. So West was working in what was what had become in the mid 18th century a, an established genre of neoclassical painting. He changes it up a bit. <laughs> In the large painting I'm showing you on the left, which is maybe known to some of you called The Death of General Wolfe. This is actually one of several versions of that painting that he created during his lifetime. It's a moment of near contemporary heroism. So uh, in 1759 at the Battle of Quebec, uh, General James Wolfe received mortal wounds to his body, but refused to let himself die, or at least that's what uh, West suggests here, until he hears news that the British forces have won. This was a pivotal battle in the Seven Years' War. In the United States, we call it the French-Indian War, but uh, here what we see is West lying almost like Christ being entombed, uh, waiting to hear the news, which is it's actually coming into the picture uh, from the left-hand side uh, that the enemy has been defeated and now he can finally give himself permission to die. It was putting this kind of high emotional but uh, didactic scene into contemporary dress that really distinguished West from many of his uh, fellow painters at the time and was one of the reasons why the King of England gave him the assignment to become the historical painter to the crown. Uh, as a result of that, West also enjoyed extraordinary privileges. He painted the royal family many, many times. I'm just showing you again on the left a portrait that uh, West made of the Queen of England, Queen Charlotte, in right about the time that he was painting the Timkins work, and then a print again made after a painting by Benjamin West of the royal family. And that proximity to the king and the way that his life became enmeshed in uh, the royal circles was not missed on British artists at the time. In fact, he uh, made him the source of great critique and some envy, I'm sure. Uh, but British um, art scene of the late 18th century had to contend with the fact that this young American upstart was uh, in the middle of this, or really the virtual center of uh, British painting. Uh, that's where our painting starts to take on some additional significance and uh, West shows in the mid 1770s, a group of works that were inspired by the great British writer Edmund Spencer's uh, poem, long epic poem, The Fairy Queen. And so I'm showing you both a portrait of Spencer from the 18th century, kind of an imagined portrait of what this early writer looked like, and then actually a 16th century edition of The Fairy Queen, which from the very start was the source of imagery. And I'm showing you this particular page because it shows uh, how early on uh, this work inspired artists to make images. Um, and there's a lot you need to know, and there's probably not enough time to explain it all here, but The Fairy Queen is an allegorical, Christian allegorical poem. <clears throat> there are all these uh, layers of meaning to the poem, and in this case, the Red Cross Knight, who's a kind of allegory for St. George and the Dragon uh, is a key character and even appears in the background of the Timkins, Fidelia, and Speranza. <clears throat> but 
my idea was to bring as many of the paintings that West did around this subject together at the Timken in 2004. And so we did uh, bring, for instance, the painting on the right, which is quite a different scene from the Timkins. It's called the Cave of Despair and shows this moment when that night, that uh, sort of double for St. George, who was also, you could say, a kind of uh, another layer of meaning for him is reading him as King George, um, who's uh, almost going to take his own life because he's been driven to despair by um, the surroundings, <clears throat> which might be an analogy for British um, views of what the Revolutionary War was bringing to their country. Um, in any case, that seems to me to be as romantic an image as you could possibly uh, create in 1770 two when West paints it, but I, I wanted to contrast it on this slide with the drawing that West makes after the Timkins painting, uh, probably maybe five or six years later, which also shows Fidelia and Speranza, faith on the left and hope on the right as delivering the Red Cross Knight from this terrible state of despair that he finds himself in uh, in the book. One of the great paintings we were able to bring to San Diego close to 20 years ago now was this one, which lives at the Wadsworth Athenaeum. It's Una and the Lion, and Una is a kind of allegory of truth. And in this case, there's a secondary level of meaning uh, between just the poem and this idea of, of truth in a Christian context, and the fact that she's able to uh, befriend this ferocious lion in the wilderness, and her representation by West uh, as a specific individual, in this case, Mary Hall. So although I didn't deal with it at the time I did the show, many of these works had um, several intricate interwoven layers of meaning. And so Mary Hall here is being equivalent, uh, made equivalent to the character of Una in Spencer's poem, but also given a kind of um, glossing as a kind of honest, truthful person by West by putting her in this mode. And so I was interested in the interweaving of these identities, including West's own identity in these pictures, but never really fully developed it. And it's something I've been thinking about lately as I look at other paintings that West did, especially of women, around the same moment. <clears throat> I'm just showing you two right now, um, his portrait of Mary Abercrombie uh, from really the same moment as the Timkins picture and then another similarly dated work, which is Catherine Weston Worrell as uh, he in this uh, painting from the exact year of the Timkins work. And I think beyond the costume, which bears a lot of resemblance to the uh, Timkins painting of Fidelia and Speranza, uh, these women's hairstyles, <clears throat> their attitudes, the fact that in the case of Worrell, she's also represented in this allegorical portrait manner, makes me think that these paintings were freighted with uh, as many uh, interwoven layers of meaning as Wes could cram into them. You know, he's both trying to satisfy patrons and give them some larger sense of um, historical meaning. And the Timkins pictures are also interwoven with his own political stances. And I, I've been interested in that for a long time, how this uh, colonial born American artist could uh, negotiate the challenges of his identity as uh, someone whose own country was in revolution with the king uh, and also serve that um, that patron well. And uh, you need to know that at this time, West is receiving lots of young artists uh, throughout his career, really, after the revolution uh, from what became the United States and is sort of viewed by them as their great teacher in England. And so I'm just showing you here. The relationship between the Timkins painting and some of these portraits that was, was producing simultaneously. I'm especially interested in the way the draperies, the bodies are intertwined with one another and that this is another level of allegory for West's own sense of interconnectedness um, between these images and uh, various other meanings. I mentioned before that West rose uh, fantastically high in the British art world in 
the 1790s, he rises higher still and becomes the second president of the Royal Academy. <laughs> which was the most important uh, body of artists in England at the time. And so here I'm showing you Henry Singleton's uh, representation of the Royal Academy in its meetings with West sort of positioned throne-like or king-like, I should say, on a throne in the center. And uh, that position really was one that put him in a lot of resentment uh, from his fellow artists, that they just could not bear the idea that this upstart from the colonies was um, given this role to lead English art into the future. <coughs> um, last year, I was invited to China to give a talk as part of an exhibition of American art, I went to Tsinghua University, and uh, the painting that I was asked to talk about then, again, we were given this assignment to talk about a singular work, was this painting by Benjamin West, which is called Windsor Great Park, or Woodcutters in Windsor Great Park, which is today at the Indianapolis Museum of Art, and dates from this later phase of West's career when he had already risen to the level of being the president of the Royal Academy and was the subject of really stinging critiques from uh, fellow artists. And I view it as a way in which uh, West now uh, tries to cling to his Englishness in the face of um, such uh, outspoken rivalry. Um, so West, you need to know, was invited to make some decorations at Windsor Chapel near Windsor Castle, which is outside of London, west of London. And um, this is a part of a body of works, just like he did a body of works around Spencer's Fairy Queen that he does depicting the countryside and, and these rural labors in the countryside. So in this case, these red, white, and blue clad woodcutters are making their way through the park. In the distance, you can see um, various buildings and West concentrates because he's spending a lot of time in this countryside. He actually has a house in Windsor that he's living in while he's making these decorations for the king. Uh, is thinking about what it means to be a landscapist in England at this moment. And uh, the British landscape painting history is so strong and so present that West must have really felt like an interloper when making these works. I'll just show you, um, this is his two sons and uh, I'm showing you the painting again because it ends up in his uh, collection at the time of his death, although he shows these works at Royal Academy exhibitions, usually to really stiff criticism, his sons uh, decide that they would like to take these paintings at the end of West's life and use them to create the first um, national museum in the United States. And they offer them to um, West's former, former country. And they're not interested. <coughs> um, so, uh, it's in, I don't mean for it to be a sad story, but I think these paintings also need to be integrated into this uh, sense of this artist's career. And um, to the, for the most part, they've been mentioned, but they haven't been really explored as demonstrations of the painter's um, wish for a deeper place in British art history. Uh, so in the end, I want to just wrap up by saying that I think these works are worthy of our attention, that they are at some level connected, not just through the biography of the artist, but through his chosen strategies for representing this twinness in his work, that he's always concerned with how things are going to fit together and that the paintings not only operate on multiple levels of allegory and inference, but they also embody this kind of intertwined narrative that I've tried to point to, both in the case of the Spencerian works and in the later career of Benjamin West. So that's all I really wanted to say today. I hope that you're all doing well and staying safe, and I hope we get to see you soon. Thanks. <laughs>